The following program presents principles designed to promote good health and is not intended to take the place of personalized professional care. The opinions and ideas expressed are those of the speaker. Viewers are encouraged to draw their own conclusions about the information presented. Welcome to Wonderfully Made. My name is Toy Proctor, and today our topic is problems with the prostate. I have as my guest Dr. Alan Handysides, who is a specialist in many areas. He's got many degrees, and I'm certainly happy to have him with us today. Dr. Handysides, I'd like to ask you a question. Would you explain the prostate and how prevalent is prostate cancer? Thank you, Stoy. That's uh a good question. First of all, the prostate is a gland that sits beneath the bladder in the male. It is very beautifully and anatomically designed so that it wraps around the little tube that drains the urine out of the bladder. And it has a special function. That function is to add fluid to the rest of the semen and protect and feed the, the, the sperm that are in that fluid. Unfortunately, as you have said, nearly every male will develop a problem with the prostate if he lives long enough. So one of the problems that uh, uh, some of our older viewers may be uh, aware of is that as the prostate gets older, it gets bigger, it enlarges. Uh, the medical term for this is prostatic hypertrophy. Now the prostate has an outer edge and uh, 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 an area that is where predominantly cancer occurs, but the innermost portion is where this hypertrophy takes place. And it starts off as clusters of cells start to grow and you begin to get uh, increasing numbers of these clusters and they coalesce to form a generally enlarged gland, which squeezes the little tube that comes out of the bladder. Consequently, males begin to find when they pass their urine that the flow starts to be a little less powerful, a little slower, and that is often the first sign of prostatic enlargement. How many people are affected every year by this condition? Well, if we're talking about uh, prostatic hypertrophy, I would think probably 65 to 75 percent of males will notice some changes in their urinary flow. Uh, the others probably have changes but don't notice them. Mm -hmm. It's probable that if we lived to the age of 100, nearly 100% 100 of males would be found to have, at autopsy, not necessarily in life, at autopsy, found to have cancer cells in their prostate. Now, this is a question probably people who have prostate, pro prostatic uh, enlargement won't need to answer, but or will need to know the answer too. But uh, how do you know whether you've got problems with the prostate? You, you've mentioned uh, the decreased flow of urine, but any other, other uh, symptoms that you might have? Uh, sometimes people can have no symptoms, no signs of a problem. And in that case, they can live their lives in blissful ignorance. And many, many people have, and for many, many years, uh, people did not understand that there were problems. But we do recommend that there are certain groups of people who should begin prostatic surveillance maybe a little earlier. For instance, we know that uh, black people, North American blacks, living here on the continent, particularly because we're in a northern climate, seem to have increasing risk of prostate cancer the further north they go. Hmm. So Canadian, black, a black man living in, Cana uh, in Canada has a greater risk of prostate cancer than does one living in Florida. So we have an environmental factor that may be playing a role. Genetic factors probably too. Mm -hmm. So we recommend that uh, American blacks should begin surveillance of their prostates maybe around the age of 40. But now that's with blacks, but with every man, uh, at sooner or later, they're probably going to have problems in this area, right? Yes. There is, a, there is a little controversy and a little argument about just how uh, avidly we should screen for prostate cancer. Uh, I think that with the Amer uh, American black we should screen early because they tend to have a more aggressive a prostate cancer than do whites. In white males we suggest that probably by the age of 50 they should also begin a, a, a program of surveillance. 
Now, suppose I've been uh, diagnosed as having enlarged prostate. When uh, does a physician begin treatment? Uh, how do I know whether I sh treatment should start? Let's talk about prostatic enlargement. First of all, uh, not everybody with an enlarged prostate is going to require treatment. Uh, this is because the symptoms may be a slowness in urinary flow, but that's not uh, a life-threatening uh, problem. And then we say, well, what kinds of treatment can be offered? Mm -hmm. uh, some of the treatments that are offered are medical treatments, such as giving uh, uh, medications that block the conversion of hydroxytestosterone into the active form. Now, that enzyme blocking can reduce the amount of testosterone and therefore reduce uh, the hypertrophy. Another approach is to give a beta stimulant, which is a, a drug that actually causes relaxation of the bladder floor and lets the urine flow more easily. So many people who are having a little a slowness, a little difficulty, maybe a little dribbling, these are all symptoms of this problem. They may uh, go to the doctor and say, can you help me? And he may give them a medication that relaxes the bladder do you floor. Do you have any names to, that you well, could, you well, could well, mention? I don't think that it, it really uh, matters. It goes, uh, clonidine mm -hmm. is the name, but I don't think that that matters. You, I would want people to go to see their doctors. Mm -hmm. Sure. One of the natural things that people can have, one of the natural remedies that has actually been shown with uh, studies that are uh, reputable studies is the use of saw palmetto. And uh, the use of saw palmetto is an herbal remedy that uh, in this situation is shown to, uh, to improve the flow and, and, and improve the situation without having very many side effects. So medically or herbally there, there are approaches that can be made. But if we, if we move from the medical, we're then talking about surgical approaches. And what about, I've heard that some people, they, they go, they, the physician goes and reams out. Well, that's a what, surgical approach, that's yes. A, oh, this is a surgical approach. That's a surgical approach. approach. In other words, surgical approach doesn't always have to just be removal of the entire prostate. No, it doesn't that's have to That's one remove, approach, right, though? That, that is one approach. Yeah, okay. You see, uh, one would prefer to have as less an invasive a procedure as possible. So if, uh, for all uh, intents and purposes, this is a benign prostatic hypertrophy, then you can go um, and uh, see your doctor and the physician can do a what's called transurethral resection of the prostate. Basically they take a very fine tube, insert it up through the urethra, which is not a very pleasant thought to many men, uh, but through that little tube they then have a little loop that is electrified and by moving the loop up and down they can shave off slivers of prostate, which are then washed and irrigated out, mm -hmm. slivers of prostate to widen the opening through the prostate gland. And that is a very successful surgical approach. Is there any other approaches? Well, yes, they, 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 there are many, many innovative approaches. Well, I mean successful approaches. Successful. They have used uh, microwaves that they will put a probe up through the prostate and then microwave the prostate. Sometimes they can put a cold probe up through there and they can actually uh, chill or freeze sections of the prostate and then that will uh, die and shrivel back and open uh, the, the, the pathway. Now, sometimes people with prostatic hypertrophy have a blood test done uh, called a prostatic specific antigen and when they get that blood test and done... And we know that as PSA, right? PSA. Okay. When they get that test done, it can be elevated in prostatic hypertrophy but that causes a problem because it's also elevated in prostatic carcinoma mm -hmm. and then we start to have a problem as to what's going on in this situation. Now you've talked a lot about uh, the enlargement. What about prostate cancer? How do I know when, if I've got an enlarged prostate, when do I know, uh, when, when should I maybe get some more tests done to find out if I've got cancer? I'm, I'm a little, you know, I could be a little worried about it. You see my index finger. I'm wagging this finger because all doctors know that the rectal examination to feel the prostate in the male is very important because the outer wall of the, pro the outer surface of the prostate is where cancer usually begins. And so by feeling across that posterior wall of the prostate, it's possible sometimes to detect a knobbly feeling or a, a, a firmness to the prostate that is unnatural. If you have an elevated PSA and you also feel that knobbliness, the doctor is immediately going to say, I think we should move to a more definitive diagnostic procedure, in which case he'll use an ultrasound. And then they will then put a transrectal ultrasound. The 
transrectal ultrasound goes up behind the prostate, it emits these sound waves. They're not electromagnetic or they're just sound waves. Mm -hmm. it, it emits the sound waves. The sound waves go through the tissue. They meet against resistance, a bounce back, and the computer image that is uh, made from all of this uh, very modern technology will then show an outline of the prostate. And they can then see if there are indeed nodules or areas in the prostate that have an altered texture or an altered uh, density to these sound waves. If they do find this, and if the PSA is elevated, then we're going to go to the definitive step. All cancer needs to be definitively diagnosed. And how do they do that? And the definitive step is a biopsy. So a needle will be taken. It can be done transperineal, it can be done transrectally. It doesn't matter how. It's a, a longish needle. Mm, ex now for the Painful. audience, explain this trance. What, is, what, well, do, you, it what do you mean by cross. trance? It, it can be across. A so cross. It's across. So the needle can be inserted across through the rectum into the prostate gland. Th through the rectum. Okay. Or it may become up through the from penis. Below. No, not through the penis. Through oh, okay. the through the through the perineum, the okay. base of the of the pelvis right. there, through the into the prostate. It's done under an ultrasound, so the directions so you know they're putting it exactly where they want to put it, mm -hmm. and then they will aspirate cells from that area. They may do ten, sixteen uh, samples to see if there's any prostate cancer cells there. Now, you've mentioned so far, first of all, we should go see our physician if we Definitely. think we have a problem. And if we're, if we're black, maybe over 40 or 45. If we're uh, in other ethnic origins, we should go maybe when we're 50. Yes. And maybe we should go every year, at least once a year, I, I probably. I think it depends on what, uh, what if our we age find is we, and what our risk If we have are. an enlargement, maybe going every, once yes. every year, right? Yes. For and instance, my father died of prostate cancer. Okay. So I know I have a 15% Rich. greater chance mm -hmm. than a man who father did not die of prostate cancer. So I take more care of myself in this regard so that I go regularly for my screenings and checks. Now, okay, so we go see our physician. He takes a PSA uh, test, blood test. Uh, if he finds some problem, he might do an ultrasound to see what kind yes. of image we have on, our, on the, prost of the prostate. And then he might do a biopsy. Yes. All right. Uh, if he finds that the biopsy is clear, there's no cancer cells, then what? Then he will put us back to routine sequential follow-up. Because it's very important, and I would like all of our people who are watching this program to understand, that you can still have prostate cancer even with a normal PSA, which means that it's not the absolute level, but it may be the trend of the PSA, which is so important. And so we would like our listeners, and particularly viewers, if you're out there listening to me and you are wondering about this, regularity in plotting and checking your PSA level may show, because if it goes long, flat, 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 and then suddenly, poo, it starts to go up, that indicates that something needs to be done. Investigation needs to be made. What's, what's a normal happening. PSA level? A normal PSA level is between uh, one and four. Uh, usually we like it to be less than one, but it, between one and four it's normal. Y though, studies have been done that show that even at a PSA of one, there may be six or seven percent of the male population in an older, over 70 age group that actually do have cancer cells in their prostate. Now what, let's take another scenario. Let's suppose someone has a reading of eight or ten and that stays steady for years. There's no biopsy, there's no, there's no biopsy. No cancer on biopsy. No cancerous biopsy. Uh, there is enlargement. Uh, what's, what kind of situation? Well, would, then in that how would you diagnose that or what would your prognosis be? In that be? situation, if you've done biopsies, you know that you, you cannot show cancer, he has an enlarged prostate, then you will attribute those elevated levels to the prostatic hypertrophy itself. So mm -hmm. the, the benign enlargement is producing more of this antigen, although it is not malignant cells that are producing. But still, you want to watch that individual on very a, at least a yearly basis. At least, probably yeah. with levels like that at six monthly. Intervals. Okay, let's suppose now we the the, the oh, by the way, uh, what will our family doctor be able to care for all this, or should you know, we family go doctors? Further? Family doctors are a linchpin in healthcare system, especially if this is a family doctor you know well, you can talk to, you can converse with, you feel at ease with. That doctor is a wonderful confidant. Now, I'm a little confused about this linchpin. What does that mean? Because he is the, the key 
in seeing that you get He's a gatekeeper. Very good. He's the like gatekeeper. gatekeeper. Okay. He is the person that is going to look out for you. And so if he finds that you have an elevated PSA, or he is suspicious, or he has ordered an ultrasound, and there's something being found, he is then going to refer you to a urologist in your community who is well-versed, well-experienced, and able to take care of you. And that's where you trust your family doctor. You don't know the urologists in your area, but the family doctors get to know which practitioners give good service, are very knowledgeable, very competent, and capable. So your family doctor is a wonderful advisor, but not necessarily the one who's going to Can give you the, the advanced treatment. Alan, suppose that uh, I've done my biopsy, and I go back to the doctor for the report, and he tells me you've got cancerous cells. What, what's the next step? I mean, besides my devastation and having a friend that's dying of prostate cancer and others that have cancer, this is serious. And I'm devastated, I know, as many people are that have cancer. But uh, what, does a, what do the doctor and I do now? Well, you know, I'm very pleased that you talked about the devastation of diagnosis. Because I don't think that physicians nor patients really understand the enormous weight that suddenly falls on an individual with a diagnosis of cancer. The good news about prostate cancer is that it is usually, and I say usually, not going to be the disease that kills you. You're going to die good news. of other things. Secondly, this is where when we began, we said this isn't a disease that affects just the individual. The whole family is going to be involved in this. And that's where a good, loving, supportive wife and family can come around and give hope. Hope is such an important ingredient when we are talking about cancer. Such essential. an essential ingredient. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's where I'm a Christian physician and I'm unabashedly uh, pleased to say so that not only do we have the support of the family, but we also have the support and the feeling that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can support us and help us go through this very difficult, difficult time. It's why, like Psalm 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. So it's nice if you can have a I Christian I shall not physician. fear prostate cancer. I will words. not fear prostate cancer. See? Now, the now what do we do, though? The diagnosis, We've got to do something. About right. It. The diagnosis has been made under the microscope. Under that microscope, they will also look at the sort of cells, how they're dividing, how aggressive they appear to be. Is this a cancer that is particularly aggressive, or is it an indolent, slow-looking cancer? And they will assign to it a score called the Gleason score. A Gleason score uh, will tell us if it's very aggressive or if it's very indolent, which may be important as to how we manage it. For instance, if I'm 90 years old and I've got a very lazy, indolent cancer, I've also got diabetes, I've had heart, three heart attacks, my kidneys are failing, I've got liver troubles and so forth, my prostate cancer is the least of my worries. worries yeah. See, mm -hmm. it's the least of my worries. If I'm a 45-year-old and my prostate cancer is a very aggressive Gleason you know, advanced, I don't want to give the numbers because we don't want to scare people, but it's advanced, then not only myself, but my doctors are going to look and say, we need to be more aggressive in the management of this uh, cancer. What's my options? Well, before diagnosed? we do options, we have to stage it. Okay. See? Because what, what's staging then? Staging is different from classifying. Classifying tells us how virulent, how aggressive, how it's going to, you know, go after us. But staging tells us how far has it gone. Okay. See? Now, if it's just confined to the prostate, stage one, we're very pleased because mm -hmm. we know that that has an excellent, excellent prognosis. If, on the other hand, when we detect it and find it, we do an x-ray and a bone survey and a bone scan, as people will be asked to do, and we find it's already in the pelvis and the, in the femur and something like that, we know that this is now stage four. This is metastasized a long way. We may find it in between stages. It may have just metastasized outside the prostate. It may have gotten to the bladder or to the rectum. It may have gone in the lymph nodes. You know, there, may, there are degrees of spread. So we'll stage it one, two, three, or four. 
Mm -hmm. And the treatment options depend on those stages. Okay, let's go through those treatment options. First of all, stage one. Well, for stage one, we have a potentially curable situation. So how are we going to cure it? Well, you could go undergo a prostatectomy, a radical prostatectomy, in which the prostate is taken away. Surgically. Surgically. You remove it, you put it in the surgical pot, the pathologist looks under it, says it looks like it's all here, all margins are clear of cancer, we've got it all in the pot. Some people that like be that. enough? Well, for some it may. Some will have a radical prostatectomy where there will be a dissection of lymph nodes up paraortics, around the pelvis. They'll dissect all those nodes, gather all the nodes in there, put those... That all would probably be stage two or three. Though. That would be a stage... Right. Well, okay. not necessarily. Really? No, no, because okay. if it's a stage two or three, we're not going to be doing this surgery because it's, mm. it's, it's the, too horse, late. the horse has fled. We're going to go to But we are other. just ensuring that we've got it all. Mm -hmm. see. The problems with surgery are that it's sometimes difficult to do the surgery without damaging nerves. What kind of nerves? Well, the pelvic nerves that are important for bladder control and also sexual function. So now, so now we're getting serious. Now that is one of the problems. Bladder, bladder. bladder control is, is a serious problem, but so is impotence to a young man. And a 40-year-old is a young man. So they now have newer but surgeries. But a 60- or 70-year-old doesn't have to worry about it, right? Well, I don't know about that. Uh, you speak for yourself, sir. Okay. I mean, uh, who knows? I'm see? asking a question. Yeah, that's right. I think that, it is I'm, I'm saying it's important. <laughs> yes, it's important. So, in other words, so it's important for most all ages. Most men who yeah, are healthy. Most men yes. are healthy. Yeah. So, in other words, okay. we want a nerve sparing operation, and skillful urologists can do a procedure which spares the nerves and yet removes the cancer. But because of this, a lot of people look to other methods for treating prostate cancer. And they are. Well, you know, when it comes to treating cancer, they usually fall into several groups. The, the one important group is a kind of radiotherapy, and a radiation therapy. But it's not all radiation therapy is not all the same, because sometimes you can put little seeds of radioactive substances, in, insert them into the prostate, and they have this kind of halo of radioactivity which kills off the prostate. So that's one method that may be used. The other is the external beam, which may be used to actually irradiate the prostate. And if there is evidence of spread, the is beam... Is that the same as protein? Proton? proton? No. That's different. This okay. is regular radio, uh, radiotherapy. Okay. Proton therapy, I'm so glad you mentioned, because proton therapy is an advance that has been brought to the world largely by Loma Linda University. Southern Loma Linda, located in Southern L California, in, right? Located in Loma Linda, Southern mm -hmm. California. And proton therapy is a most fantastic therapy because the proton waves can actually be contoured, which you can't do. Radiation goes in a straight line. The protons, they can actually contour it a little bit so that they can actually deliver these protons into a given shape. Alan, I'm very interested in this proton therapy at Loma Linda University. You know, people today, being in the area of nutrition, people are, are concerned about microwave ovens. Now, how does this proton affect the rest of my body? Does it, well, you know, if I just, it's designed for the prostate. But what about other parts of our, my, our body? Does it affect that at all? Well, a proton is a subatomic uh, particle that is put in uh, to this very, very prescribed place. And uh, it's not going to affect the rest of your body. It's only going mm -hmm. to affect that particular portion where it's focused. Then it's going to diffuse out and, and disappear and dissipate. Uh, of course, it's not just prostate therapy. This can be used for many, many different mm -hmm. applications. So it's a wonderful, wonderful advance. In fact, MD Anderson is just in the process of getting one installed. Where's that located? That I'm not. Don't know whether I can't give you the location. Uh, and it's in Texas. Isn't it? It's in Texas, I yeah. think. But I'm not Houston, sure. Yes. And so is uh, at Harvard. They have one in Boston. They have one of those. These things cost millions of dollars. The one at Loma Linda, I happen to know. Uh, was developed there. Uh, Dr. Slater was the doctor that put that, uh, and his team put that together, and it cost many millions of dollars uh, mm -hmm. to, to get into place. But a very, very effective and proven therapy for prostate cancer. Now, I'm very interested. You've uh, first talked about options that a person may have that's been diagnosed with prostate cancer. First of all was surgery, then it was radiotherapy, uh, then it was the proton. Uh, now, is this the order that usually uh, you're treated in? Yes. Uh, in surgery, the, the first before, 
for the proton? Or? This depends on the stage. Remember? Okay. So when we get to more advanced forms, then prostate cancer is very often dependent on testosterone, male hormone, to fuel its fire of cell division and so forth. So by blocking testosterone production, either with certain medications that block it, so there are testosterone blockers, uh, there's also a substance called a GnRH analog, which is actually a pituitary uh, stimulator, and it can shut the pituitary production of luteinizing hormone down uh, so that we don't get the production of testosterone. Uh, that can be used, things like lupride and uh, uh, some, some of those uh, medications given by injection or pellets. And then, of course, there is another surgical approach, which is, in a way, an indirectly a kind of uh, medical therapy, and that is castration to remove the testicles so that they do not produce uh, testosterone. So, yes, we have a full range of treatments. Now, there's one you haven't mentioned, though. What about drug therapy? Any, any, any a promise there? Yes, drug therapy, chemotherapy, well, there are many agents that will uh, attack rapidly dividing cells. Uh, but in practice for prostate cancer, we tend to find that the therapies have been more along the lines of these uh, hormonal manipulations. Mm. Uh, occasionally, a person will get severe bone pain, and that will respond oftentimes very well to non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, later on, it may be more powerful medications will be required. And on occasion, a shot of radiation to a, a lesion in a bone will relieve bone pain. Uh, so many, many uh, therapies, a team approach to one's care. And that's why, yes, the second opinion is very important. I'd like to leave the last minute or two to prevention. Now, uh, there's a lot of herbs. You've mentioned, I think, uh, sauce pimento. But uh, what about prevention or, um, yeah, what about prevention? Is there any way we can, you know, we the can literature... keep from going through getting, getting this uh, surgery or this proton therapy our radical prostectomies and so on. The literature has looked at that, and the Adventist Health Study done out of Loma Linda University has looked at that in great detail. Uh, Baldwin presented a paper that suggested that the, the regular consumption of tomatoes provides sufficient lycopenes, especially if they're cooked tomatoes, uh, give sufficient lycopenes to reduce the risk. Okay, what else, quickly? Well, uh, I think that that's, that's the main one. Soy products are another. Soy milk, a daily glass of soy, soy milk, may be very helpful. But I think the lemon in the study showed that those who had two or three glasses of soy milk had a lot less yes, prostate lot less. cancer. That's a well, possibility. But, but the study was not sufficiently uh, broad that we can make a definitive statement that if you drink soy milk, you won't get prostate. Remember, mm -hmm. with all of these things, although lifestyle can lower your risk, it doesn't always prevent it. Alan, that's a very good point. And I'd like to thank you today for being our guest. It's been a pleasure of discussing this topic with you. It's been a pleasure for me, too, and a privilege. Thank you. You know, with our audience, I'd like to leave one other point, and that is if you are diagnosed with prostate cancer, it's not your fault. And uh, God can be with us during this time of need.